if we want to know why, why yes. would it, any Christian keep Sunday instead of the Sabbath, the first day instead of the seventh, um, we're going to look at every reference to Sunday, except you realize the word Sunday does not appear in the New Testament. Sometimes you'll hear the word sundry, if you're reading the King James, sundry is not Sunday. Sundry means different. God in various times and sundry manners spoke to the prophets in time past. That means different manners. Um, so if you look at every reference to the first day of the week, which is what we commonly refer to as Sunday, you might find if there's a change. There's eight references in the New Testament. Now nobody's going to argue the Old Testament because it's very clear it's the seventh day there. So we're going to take them one by one. Does that sound fair? And we'll look at them and see what the Bible says. Look at the first four references are simply historical. They are talking about the time of the resurrection. Matthew 28 verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, uh, my friend Harold Camping, uh, I say that a little bit sarcastically, I apologize. Uh, Harold Camping was the founder of Family Radio, a good radio station. I listened to them, but uh, he used to answer Bible questions and he would always, when people asked about the Sabbath, he would go to this verse. He'd say, see what it says right there? The end of the Sabbath. That means the Sabbath is now over. You don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore. I said, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that that week after the crucifixion, after the Sabbath was over, it's saying that they came early in the morning on the first day of the week. You tried to build a whole doctrine. I told you there's 11 different answers if you ask 10 different pastors the reason why. As it began towards the first day of the week. Now, is that a new command to keep the first day? Do you find built into that anything that says now we have a new Sabbath day? It's on the first day. No, it's a simple historical record. Now, did, was it important that Jesus rose on the first day of the week? Absolutely. Does that make it a new Sabbath? Was there anything wrong with the seventh day where God had to now change it? No. Was the seventh day Sabbath chosen before or after sin? Before sin. It's part of God's perfect plan. There's nothing wrong with it. Did God do important things on Thursday? Was the Lord's Supper important? That's Thursday. Does it make it a new Sabbath? How important is the crucifixion? What day of the week was that? Friday. Is that a new Sabbath? Not for us, it is for the Muslims. So the Lord does different things, but He didn't command us to keep any other day than the first day. That would be like saying, I made a mistake with the seventh day, um, now it's the first. So he had a little slip of the tongue there. He, uh... <laughs> He mistakenly said, my position, which I was like when I first heard this, oh, Doug, you may have finally gotten it. But Harold Camping, seriously? <laughs> false date setter, false prophet, Harold Camping? That's the, an exegete you're going to refer to? Okay. So notice, he asks, was the seventh day chosen before or after sin? Doug, it wasn't man's seventh day before the fall. It was God's. It was man's first day based on the evening to evening cycle. And man would have started his week with the Sabbath every week until he broke the creation trying to be his own God. And his rest was cursed along with the work. But God was merciful in promising the Messiah who would come and destroy the works of the devil, restoring what was lost, redeeming creation, bringing man back into his pre-fall conditions. That is what's underway currently while he makes all of his enemies a footstool. The first day Sabbath has been restored, which points us to the completed work of redemption in Christ and ultimately God's rest, which is the final destination. You guys memorialize the old fallen creation as if the Messiah hasn't come. But because you don't understand new creation, you can't see it. It wasn't just because important things took place that day. And then you could just appeal to important things on any day. And, wow. It isn't the same as the Lord's Supper and the crucifixion. Yes, all of those are important. But it isn't just because it's important. The resurrection was the turning point of the new creation. Not the Lord's Supper. Not the crucifixion. This just evidences your weak theology around the resurrection. This wasn't just an, an important thing. It was a cataclysmic universe altering thing. You also, again, didn't utilize the HGM at all to arrive at your conclusion. 
Again, Ted Wilson warned to be on the lookout for anyone who isn't utilizing the historical grammatical method. You just breezed over the text on a flawed foundation to show why it can't be the case that this has anything to do with the church gathering corporately on the first day of worship. You didn't even bother to cite the entire pericope and walk through the text, bringing out the author's intended meaning, understanding what the original audience would have had, which is what the HGM is all about. <laughs> had you done so, you would have realized why this passage is far more complicated than you make it sound. In fact, you guys love Martin Luther. I've heard you cite him on his views regarding the state of the dead, which he shifted on later in his life, by the way, due to the biblical text. Well, let's look at his translation of this verse and then the mechanics around why he arrived at the conclusion that he did. Luther was utilizing the Textus Receptus manuscript line, which is what the King James was translated from, that the SDAs love. How does he translate it? As first day Sabbath. Quote, Luther's translation. Now in the evening of the Sabbath, which began in the morning of the first solemnity of Sabbaths, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So Luther's 1545 translation picks up on the Greek grammar and the fact that the word for Sabbath and dawn of the first day of the week, like you see in the ESV, are the exact same word. You can see the Greek, the literal rendering of it out, and then how the ESV in this case renders it. Same identical word for both. Same identical word for Sabbath is used twice in the sentence in the same context using the same grammar. It is arbitrary to then translate the first instance as Sabbath and the second one as first day of the week. Listen to why Dr. Kaiser thinks that the most natural uh, rendering of the text is first day Sabbath, like Luther, Beza, Miles Cloverdale, and a number of other translators through the years. He says, quote, First, so he's going to give three reasons why he believes this is how it should be translated. First, this was the way Jews translated the Hebrew for the Sabbath into Greek. For those who think that the genitive, that's just the verb, or no, that, no, sorry, ignore me. For those who think that the genitive should be translated with an of, it should be noted that the usual case for Sabbath is the genitive since its original meaning was of rest. So meaning a day of rest. Thus, the Greek translation, not the Hebrew, the Greek translation of Exodus 20 is simply the Sabbath. And Matthew 28, 1 is simply an after the Sabbath. Likewise, the singular day Sabbath is usually in the plural. This can be seen by even a casual glance through a Greek concordance. Why does the translation have to change when the form uh, 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 is the same? For both words in Matthew 28, 1. While it is possible to paraphrase Sabbath as weak, there's only one biblical text where such a paraphrase would be helpful, which is Luke 18, 12. And that is simply because I fast twice since the Sabbath would be way too wooden for an English translation. Close quote. So what he is saying is that it is arbitrary to translate the same word in the same sentence two different ways when they're being used in the identical context. Which would mean that the most natural rendering of the text would be first day Sabbath. He continues. Second, the grammar calls for it. Keep in mind that the word first is in the feminine singular accusative, whereas Sabbath is neuter pr uh, plural genitive, just as in the Greek form, not the Hebrew, of the fourth commandment. Therefore, it is clear that first does not modify Sabbath, but rather it modifies the implied word day. This construction occurs several times in the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Therefore, it is grammatically impossible to translate it as one of the Sabbaths. It has to be first day Sabbath. Third, the ancient translations translated as first day Sabbath. A listing of other occurrences of first-day Sabbath in the New Testament helps to make the previous points clear. Close quote. 
So that first part, he's responding to those Greek grammarians that would claim that the word first is modifying the word Sabbath. So it should be more accurately translated as one of the Sabbaths, which is how some people have translated. Dr. Kaiser, on the other hand, argues that the word day is implied in the phrase Sabbath, which can be seen in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, specifically in Exodus 20, which shows that it must be first day Sabbath, not simply one of the Sabbaths. Furthermore, the ancient translations of the biblical text, like the Ethiopic translation, also translated as such. Then on top of that, we're going to look at some of these other ones. The other texts that have the same Greek construction, they all do the same thing. So the purpose in saying this is to not appear like I'm some Greek grammarian. I'm not. But I've tried digging into both sides of the discussion. So I can say with confidence that it is a lot more complicated than Doug made it out to be. Just breezing over the text, not actually examining why theologians down through the centuries have appealed to this text the way they have. Oh, but there's no rhyme or reason for it. It's just a silly claim. Especially considering he appealed to Greek regarding the Sabbath being made for man earlier. Anthropos, which I agree, will do that same thing here as well. And with Lord's Day in Revelation 1.10. I had a friend a few weeks ago. He sent me a response from an Adventist to first day Sabbath being in the Greek but essentially getting lost in translation to some degree. The, the guy claimed no serious theologian or translator ever translated it this way. Oh, so Martin Luther, Miles Coverdale, Theodore Beza, the modern King James, the Vulgate, the Clementine Vulgate, and, and numerous other translations. All the individuals involved in those works are not serious translators. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay. Now let's actually read Matthew 28, 1 through 10, and look, at, and look at the reason this text is cited by Christians historically with regards to the first day being significant, because Doug didn't even address it. It says, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, "Do not be afraid, for I know what you see. Or I, I know what you seek. Jesus, who is crucified, he is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he had risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him." See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Close the reading of God's holy word. Now we looked at this a couple weeks ago. What do we see? Well, actually, let me bring that back up. The substance of everything the church does all taking place on the first day Sabbath. Not just the first day Sabbath, the first first day Sabbath in the new creation. <laughs> Both Marys heard the gospel from the messenger, an angel, someone bringing the gospel message. They were told the good news, he is risen. They believe that message and then go to meet Jesus. We're told he met with them in verse 9. The word of God, which is what Jesus' words are, is then spoken over them. Upon doing so, they cling to him and worship him. After doing so, they're then sent out by Christ to take the gospel to others. This is exactly what the substance of the church gathering on the first day is. We leave our place of dwelling. We meet with Jesus who is present in a special way. We worship him. The word of God is spoken over us, washing us in it. We believe it. We cling to him, partake of him at his table in the supper. And then we're sent out into the world to take them the gospel. Just because they aren't in a formalized building with an organized liturgy passing the offering plate, 
doesn't mean the substance of what the church does isn't all present there. Yet according to the SDA church, what the Marys did will one day be the mark of the beast because it's part of Satan's plan for you to worship Jesus on the first day. Just totally whacked thinking. Nevertheless, this is what happens when you do a surface skimmed over proof text drive-by method that Doug uses, where he just makes a bunch of assertions, assumes his position is just a given, and everyone else is confused, deceived by Satan or whatever else. Oh, it's just talking about history. No, dude, there's way more going on there than history. The line's not drawn there. There's like way more theology going on there. 